the La Crosse Public Library Archives presents Dark La Crosse Stories, a series in collaboration with the La Crosse Tribune. Dark La Crosse is a suite of programs that feature the seedier side of La Crosse history and also include a downtown walking tour, a trolley tour, and an annual stage production with new content each year. In 1932, just before the casino bar opened to provide lacrosse with proudly proclaimed lousy service, the building was the home of Paul Johnston's barbershop. He was well known and respected in the community. Then, in September of 1932, Paul Johnston's world began to crumble. His wife, Frances Johnston, 13 years younger, filed for divorce and moved into her own apartment. Johnston was devastated. September 21st, Jostin spotted his estranged wife at the horse races at the La Crosse Interstate Fairgrounds. She was in the company of two out-of-town jockeys, among others. Jostin seethed with jealousy. Later that evening, the jockey, Billy Smith from St. Paul, Minnesota, pulled away from the curb of an apartment at North 4th Street. In his car sat Francis Jostin, George Stewart, and Stewart's wife. What they did not know was that Paul Jostin was tailing them. At some point, Frances recognized her husband's car and she urged Billy Smith to lose him. Unacquainted with the city streets here in La Crosse, Smith ended up at a dead end. He leapt from the car just as Jostin pulled in. Jostin jumped from his car, pulled out a pistol and said, I told you I was going to get you, and now I got you. Paul Jostin shot Billy Smith through the chest, killing him instantly. He then pulled the gun on his wife and fired three times. George Stewart made a lunge for the gun, but Jostin swung around and shot him as well. Paul Jostin then calmly returned to his car and drove to his barber shop. He wrote out two notes, one to his mother, the other to the La Crosse Fire and Police Commission. Then he picked up the telephone and called the police. I guess a person usually only writes one suicide note, but I'm writing two. I hope my note to my ma convinces her that my actions were justified. As for Frank, well, he's on the police and fire commission. He may have other ideas about what justice is, but for some reason, I feel compelled to let him know why I think I was right in what I did. Well, let's get this over with. Yeah, Sergeant Hart Horshack. This is Paul Jostin. Yeah, that's right, the barber who cut your hair last week. Well, I'm in my barber shop on Pearl Street right now, and I just thought you might be inter- interested to know that I just shot and killed a man, and I killed another guy for interfering. Well, yeah, and I, I shot my wife, too. Don't worry, Sergeant Orshak, I'm not going anywhere. You find me right here. I'll uh, I'll leave the door open for you. I never suspected that when I opened this place, I'd be ending my life here. I don't think they're going to let a killer into heaven, so maybe I'll just stay right here. As the sirens approached... Paul Jostin put the pistol to his head and fired a bullet to his brain. The police found him in a pool of blood. He died two hours later. George Stewart would die two days following the shooting. Frances Jostin, however, did not die. She recovered from her injuries and moved away from the cross. Her fate is unknown. Paul Jostin's fate is well known. His barbershop became the casino bar the following year, and his ghost is believed to haunt it to this day. And now I'd like to welcome in Bill Peterson, former archives librarian who recently retired after 34 years of service, who did some of the initial research for this story. The original concept of the Dark Lacrosse walking tour was to present true stories that could be connected to a specific place, usually a building, in the central part of downtown Lacrosse. These events also had to have happened fairly close to each other geographically, so as to accommodate a walking tour. While our newspaper clipping files in the archives had plenty of tragic stories in them, finding one connected to a place in the specified area was a challenge. 
Also, most of the stories in the clipping file only dated back to the late 1970s when the library began clipping stories on a regular basis out of the lacrosse papers. We wanted to make sure the dark tour didn't include anything too recent that may be still remembered by people involved over the fear of opening old wounds that had healed somewhat over time. So anything after the mid-1950s or so was considered off limits. This story involving the casino tavern illustrates that sometimes there are a few actual facts behind the ubiquitous urban legend in local history. The legend here is that the casino was haunted and that the legend is based on the actual events leading to Paul Jostin's suicide in the building that currently houses the casino. And it seems every ghost story is linked to a tragic death and this piece of local history certainly qualifies on that scale. Now, even without this tableau of jealousy and revenge attached to it, the history of the casino is quite entertain entertaining, and I would encourage everyone listening to visit the archives at the La Crosse Public Library and check it out. The tavern's early, over-the-top promotions were legendary. In fact, I wonder if the primary motive behind these pretentious advertisements was to convince potential customers that there was nothing dark or foreboding left over from the Jostin tragedy. It was almost as if the casino ownership was saying, hey, we're crazy, fun-loving people here, so come in, have a good time, and don't even think about the fact that the booth you're sitting in was the exact spot where a murderer of two people committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. Enjoy our five-cent highballs. The big thing I wish I could have been able to find out more about during the research for this story was the relationship between Paul Jostin and his wife. The way the story played out in the newspaper, and consequently, the way it was told on the dark tour, seems to make out Paul Jostin as a tragic figure. He was angry that the woman he loved was having an affair with a jet-set horse racer. He snapped and took matters into his own hands, eventually ending his own life after realizing what he had done. However, Francis Jostin and his wife had started divorce proceedings two weeks prior to the shooting. Was this because she was in love with another man? or because Paul Jostin was a controlling, obsessive, even abusive husband, and she had to get away. He had been following her around town, something that in today's legal system could have led to a restraining order. There were no real shelters for victims of domestic abuse at the time, and it seems the courts took a less sympathetic view of the woman's situation back then. Considering Paul Jostin's actions, it's hard not to consider this as a possibility. Finally, I wondered why Jostin had gone to his place of business to commit suicide rather than his own home. Was it because since his wife had left him, he felt more at home in his barbershop than his actual house? Or was there a more simple explanation, like his barbershop had a telephone he could use to call the police and his home did not? These are questions that may never be answered. Thank you for listening.